here's the first part of this question. Um, the first thing that I, I, I've put in this um, bonus problem was to think about the biggest triangle in terms of area. I, mean, I think I'm always thinking in terms of area. The biggest triangle that you can fit inside a circle of radius one. Now, there's something going on here about um, whether what what obvious is, and obvious is different things for different people. Um, uh, and it's it's possible to prove even things that look pretty obvious. Um, here, I'm going to claim that some things are obvious just to save time and to show you where I how I like to think about this. Um, and then if necessary, we can come back and talk about whether they're really obvious or not. Um, for example, I think it's obvious that the biggest triangle you can put inside a circle should have all of its corners on the edges of the circle. All of the corners should be on the edges. On the, I said edges of the circle, I mean on the outside. They should all go, you know, outwards. And if I really had to prove that, I think I'd sit down and talk about, oh, well, if you move this um, perpendicularly away from the base on the other side, so if you think of this as the base, and you move away from that, then you can think about making the area of this triangle bigger by adding on this sort of delta-shaped part over here. Okay, so it should probably be, have all of its corners somewhere on the outside. And now there's this kind of optimization problem to think, well, if I've got three points A, B, and C on the outside of this um, circle, um, what's the area there? Uh, and you can go and write down some formula for what the area is for general, you know, if these have some uh, some positions, sort of theta around the circle, phi and um, theta, phi and uh, another Greek letter or whatever. Um, then you can write that down as a sort of problem to say, well, I know the area in terms of theta and phi, some horrible expression in terms of theta and phi, and then maybe I could do some calculus on it to try and maximise that. Um, but it turns out there's a slightly better geometrical way to think about this that will give us insight for the pentagon problem as well, which is why this is the first part of a two-part question, um, which works like this. Um, suppose, suppose B and C are fixed. And the question is just to make the area of this triangle as big as possible by moving A. Then the thing we want to do is, I suppose thinking about that same idea again, think about this as the base of the triangle. You have to turn your head sideways a little bit um, to think about BC as the base, that's fixed. We want to make the perpendicular height of this triangle as big as possible. That means thinking about moving A as far away as possible um, on, from the line BC. So I'm drawing in these dotted lines that are parallel to BC, and I want A to be as far away as possible from, from BC. So just on this point over here, where the parallel lines meet the outside of the circle. I'm trying to make these parallel lines, you see, they're kind of measuring the height of the triangle like one of those height charts where you stand up against it and it tells you how height how high you are. We want we want to get we want to get this triangle as tall as possible, so we should move I'll turn my head that way. Uh, we should move this point all the way over here. Um, and then we've got to think about where that point is. Well it's the point where <laughs> is the point where um, the tangent is per the tangent to the circle is perpendicular to a line that's also perpendicular to BC. And think about circles a bit. And it turns out that you can prove that this point is um, directly opposite the midpoint of BC. Okay, I fast forwarded a little bit there, but I think this is the key idea to think about. Um, if B and C are fixed, then A should be opposite midpoint. Okay. So that's one powerful result to say, um, whatever your biggest triangle looks like, um, it, it's probably going to have to be isosceles um, because A, um, AC is going to end up being the same length as AB. Um, if not, then move A around to make the triangle bigger um, until you get this isosceles triangle. Um, but actually, there's nothing special about A. Uh, so this says triangle triangle will be isosceles, or sorry, isos, uh, 
isos. So let's just put some squiggles. Isosceles um, uh, <laughs> um, AB equals AC. And of course, there's nothing special about A, so in fact, all the pairs of sides should be isosceles. Um, the second half of this question talks about a pentagon. Um, and I think we did this one on on a live stream at some point, but I'll run through it again. Um, again, it seems like people believe that the, the points should be on the sides of the triangle somewhere. Um, and then I think the way to proceed is to similarly say, look, I want to move this point as far away from this perpendicular line as possible. So if it's like in a setup like this, um, we can make the we can make this triangle bigger by moving this point up to this corner. Uh, because if thinking about this as the base of our triangle, I just wrote the word base and then crossed it out with a line. Amazing. Um, we, if we think about this as the base of the triangle, um, then we can make the height as big as possible by getting this point as far away as possible, um, which it feels like is going to be ext extremized um, right at the the corner of this this pentagon. So it feels like we should have the the points at um, at corners, um, then there's sort of two possibilities, either a triangle like this or a triangle like this with a short side as uh, an isosceles triangle with shortest with one of the sides as the shortest side or an isosceles triangle with the shortest with the shortest with the side length as one of the isosceles sides. Goodness me. Um, and we had a way of thinking about this as well to find out what the areas of these triangles are. Um, think about how, if you think about this as the base, this is the height, this is the base, this is the height. Oh, hello, come on, opposite corner. Then this triangle, this triangle is biggest. Right, so <laughs> here's an example where if I have B and C over here, with this parallel to another side, then there's a whole family of triangles with equal area. I could put A over here, but I can also move A all the way along this side, and because these lines are parallel, all of these triangles have equal area. So sometimes there's this slightly degenerate case where it's not extremal to put um, it's not unique to uniquely extremal to put the to put the other corner at a to put the other corner of the triangle at a corner of the pentagon. Sometimes anywhere on the side will do, like like this case where one of your side, the sides of your triangle is parallel to one of the sides of the pentagon. Of course, that's the case for our solution triangle, um, which had uh, one side um, along one of the sides. There's actually this family of solutions. So here's the one we drew above. Um, but there's also, you can move this point along, you can slide this point along here, and you'll get a triangle with the same area where I'm thinking about thinking about this side as the base. These have all got the same height because these, these lines are parallel. Um, so this is an infinite family of solutions. Okay, right. Here's the first part. Um, I asked you about this, well I gave you this fact from the math syllabus and asked a bit cheekily, can you find me two functions, f and g, so that the derivative of the first one is the second one and the derivative of the second one is the first one. Um, and if you try e to the kx for f of x, then you find that g of x, well that's the derivative of f of x, so that'll be k e to the kx, and then g prime of x will be k squared e to the kx. So this has worked if k squared equals one. Okay, there's two, there's two solutions, k equals one or k equals minus one. If you use one, then you get e to the x again, um, which is all right. You know, there's e to the x, um, that satisfies, you know, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and then the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Uh, oh, right, okay, so we've, we've gone around in a little circle, e to the x. That's kind of not, not a very satisfying solution. Um, I left that in as a kind of way for 
people to be cheeky. I'm glad that someone in chat has been cheeky. Oh, it's another other other James has been cheeky. Is that, just use, use the X again. Um, that's going to knock over the rest of these problems. Um, but luckily we found this interesting solution as well. Here's an interesting solution, e to the minus x. I think it's pretty cool. Um, that gives us two functions, f of x e to the minus x and g of x minus e to the minus x. And they have the derivative of the first one is the second one and the derivative of the second one is the first one. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, then I gave you this weird thing about trigonometric functions. Um, I don't know if people have seen derivatives of trigonometric functions or not. Um, but if you have, then you might have seen uh, this thing about like sine goes to cos goes to minus sine goes to minus cos and then you get back around to sine again. Um, if you haven't seen this, don't worry about it. Um, you go around in this loop like this. So I've kind of disguised that as this, writing it up formally as this f, g, h, and j functions like that. Um, okay, the kind of major part of this question um, is to have um, three functions. The derivative of the first to the second one, derivative of the second to the third, derivative of the third to get back to the first. So this cycle of length three. We could use e to the x again, right? We could just have all of these be e to the x and then all of these equations are true. Um, you could also, I mean, there's a, there's a second, um, hidden in here, there's a second even cheekier answer, which is you could have all of them be the zero function, all zero, um, because the derivative of the zero function, you know, the function that's constantly zero, um, is the you know, zero function as well. So that, that works with random cycle. That's somehow also not interesting in the same way that just setting everything to be e to the x is um, a solution. If you try something like this again, so if you try e to the kx, um, then you, it turns out that the thing you want, like over here, we found that we wanted k squared to be one after we've done two derivatives. Here we want k cubes to be one. Now we know a solution to, to this is k equals one, The other solutions are complex numbers. Um, so if you're happy with complex numbers, um, then you can write things that maybe look a bit like nonsense. So you take k to be, or if k is minus a half plus root three over two i, um, then you can use that in e to the kx as your function for f of x. And then it'll do exactly what you want it to do, so that after you've done three derivatives, you get back to where you started. So there's this, there's this e, to the, e to the x solution over here. And there's this other interesting solution, which looks like, I suppose, e to the minus half x, e to the root three over two i x. Um, and it turns out that you can combine these functions together if you like. Um, there's another one with a different root for k. You can combine them together if you like and make a kind of, um, if you're suspicious about this function, uh, then there's a way to say, oh, e to the i, e to the i stuff, that looks like cos and sine, right? Um, and it turns out that, it turns out that, I suppose, I'm skipping over some kind of further maths university stuff here. It turns out that e to the minus a half x cos of root 3 over 2 x works for f of x. That's for f of x. So that's my, oh I've missed the 2 on my overlay there slightly. I uh, can't change that. That's root 3 over 2. Root 3 over 2 x works. Which is pretty, um, Pretty, pretty much, um, pretty weird. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm using Euler's formula secretly behind the scenes. Right, Prime's question is a question that I've been asking different groups of people for years. I love it. Um, it's based around this kind of joke to start off with that 91 out of all of the numbers under 100, 91 is the one that looks the most prime out of the numbers that are not prime. Um, it's got these it's got these massive prime factors. Oh my word, how do you spell? There we go. It's seven times 13 or something. This is not prime, but it does look prime. So that's, that's the joke there. And the other ones, um, you're supposed to spot factors of them or fa spot ways to factorize them. So this one 
you're not supposed to check numbers being factors of it. That would be really, really hard to do. That's why I banned calculators. Um, I don't think that's very fun. I want these bonus problems to be fun. Um, something that I thought you might spot is that this is one less than 3,600, which, you know, you've got to be quite brave to write something like, like that down because it, it doesn't feel like you've made progress at all. It, it, it kind of looks really silly. Um, but actually, the reason I've written it like that is because I'm thinking about writing it as 60 squared minus 1 squared. Um, so then it's 60 minus 1 times 60 plus 1. Um, which is 59 times 61. So this is not prime either. And this is secretly a difference of two squares. Woo, love dots. Um, okay, so other things that are going on in this question um, are... This one is... Um, so this one you're supposed to use, you, you know, you, once you've seen the difference two squares thing, you might be on to me that, that most of these numbers you're supposed to stare at and find, oh, hang on, I can just see, um, see a factor of these or see a way to factorize these. Um, I'm not supposed to check lots of numbers. Um, this one I put in, I thought maybe you, if you had some familiarity of how multiplying together, um, kind of numbers, large numbers then you might see that sometimes like if you're multiplying like 1006 if you want to do like 1006 times 29 or something then you do 29,000s and 29,6s and they kind of behave quite separately and here this kind of looks like 101 written out twice so maybe if you've multiplied a lot of large numbers together in your time you'll, you'll recognize that this is 1001 times 101 so this is a kind of multiplication recogni recognition um and the last two, it's not the last two either. This one I put in, you're supposed to notice that these numbers are the binomial coefficients, or the, the sort of thing that you get if you multiply out thing to the power of four. So if you've done a lot of multiplying out thing to the power of four, then you might spot that that's what's going on here. Um, there's still a challenge to actually work out what's been raised to the power of four, but in fact, this is 101 to the power of four. I'm thinking again about how multiplying by 100 shifts things along. Um, so I, I, I thought of this as 100 plus 1 binomially expanded out. Okay, so that's not prime either. So it's not this one. It's not this one. It's not this one. It's not this one. This one is just a multiple of 3. I felt like I wanted one more. Um, the digit sum is a multiple of 3. Um, and this one is pushing it a little bit. But this is the um, sort of cousin of difference of two squares, this is sum of two cubes, socked, um, which says that, I think we covered this in a live stream at some point, a cube plus b cube, weirdly factorized, it doesn't really look like it should factorize, but it does, it factorizes like this, um, where I know that difference of two squares gets taught in a lot of places, and it's a great trick, um, sum of two cubes doesn't, I don't really see that a lot, so hey, um, Maybe somebody's watching this, somebody who's watching this has seen this for the first time. And so welcome to sum of two cubes. It's like difference of two squares, but you know, like all of the magic of different of two squares, but an entirely different fact that you now know. Um, well, in that in that vein, okay, so it's the sum of two cubes because it's uh, this is a cube, 125 is a cube, 729 is a cube. If you know some cube numbers because you've been thinking about UKMT team challenges or something. Then you might know some cubes. These are cubes. Um, so this is 50 cubed plus 9 cubed, I think. So it's a multiple of 59. Mad. Okay, right. This was this was supposed to be a tricky bit. Yeah, so extensions to this. If you've seen some of this stuff for the first time, think, oh, maybe you've just learned sum of two cubes. You might also be interested in sum of two fourth powers, which is just crazy. It's so crazy that I, I want to show you it now. Um, sum, of two, sum of two fourth powers factorizes like this. This just, just shouldn't work. Um, I love it so much. I think I think it's like that. With a, I think I've got the right number of root twos. Factorizes like that. Those aren't whole numbers, um, if A and B are whole numbers in general. Um, but, so maybe this isn't helpful for testing whether things are primes or not. Uh, you might have seen, so the link to Pascal's triangle, some people in chat seem to be interested in that. Um, and I say try, try working out 1001 to the 6 or something. Um, if this if this was interesting to you, you'll love a thousand a thousand and one to the six, um, and you'll love sort of working out with work out the square cube fourth power. Keep going. What, what, what's going on? Um, that, that might be a fun thing to see. Oh, by the way, this is prime. 
There's nothing special about this number as far as I know. It's just I just looked up some big primes. Right, okay, cool. Um, that's that's all that's going on in the prime numbers question. Um, the joke is kind of, instead of testing factors, all of these have some sort of link to some algebra or something um, so that you can spot a way to factorize them and then find some numbers. Um, so I tried to come up with all of the different ways I could think of to hide um, a way to factorize it, to have like. One approach to this, oh, by the way, this is separately known on the web. Um, so there's loads of resources on this or loads of, uh, it's also called the teacup problem. That's where I first saw it um, on, on an enrich activity. Let's see if I can find that page. Um, ignore this bit, this problem's really hard. <laughs> and Richard describing this as a problem for seven to 14 year olds. I've given this to everyone. Um, everyone finds it hard. We do it a lot at maths festivals and things. Uh, right, okay, teacup's problem. Um, four sets of, there's a different way of phrasing the problem, four sets of sources and cups, and you want to have um, different, uh, all the sources in each row and column different, all the cups in each row and column different, and each combination of cups and sources. Um, okay. So this is uh, this is like an interactive way of playing around with this. Uh, so this is the same problem, but with cups and sources instead of playing cards. Um, we use this at a lot of things. Um, so if you're interested in this, search for N N Rich Teacups um, website name Teacups Problem. And you can find this way of playing around with it as well. And the thing that you're trying to build, I suppose, with let's say the sources, is you want one saucer of each colour in each row and in each column. And it's tricky because you might find halfway through that your your solution's forced. I think I've done this right. Yeah, but if I'd done it, oh, yeah, okay. I think that works. Um, this is called a Latin square, by the way. Um, one of each thing in each row and each column. The challenge, I suppose, is do you want the suits to be a, this is called a like Latin square. And you want the um, face cards, the face values. What are they, what are they called? To be in a Latin square too. That's tricky because you can't use the same Latin square on top of each other. Otherwise, all of your kings will be hearts or all of your queens will be spades or something. If you, if you line things up too much, you want kind of two very different. Uh, you want two different different Latin squares um, so that you know so there's enough chaos between the two and as you as you lay out your two Latin squares you get this solution between the two but it's possible to find this just by grabbing 16 cards and shuffling them around um, until you've got something something that works I'm really reluctant to just show you people the solution to this um, there is a solution it, it is possible this is this is not uh, this is find a way to do this it is possible. Keep keep trying. Um, cool. Um, but I'm very reluctant to say anything. I have decided I don't want to answer this problem. I really like watching people get very stuck on this problem. Um, I wanted to tell you about something else to do with Latin squares, though. So let's define Latin square. Latin square um, has the sort of Sudoku Sudoku rules. No repeats in any column or right. So you might have something like, it's kind of a basic one where you go sort of A, B, C, D, and then you shift everything sideways, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. That works. Um, there are other ones as well though. Um, so there's other ones where you um, do something uh, a bit different. Uh, there's, there is way more than one solution to the teacups problem. Um, I've seen a few and then deciding whether they're the same but rotated and have colors swapped or not or whether they're genuinely different is an interesting interesting question something that I was excited to find out is that there's an application from Latin squares to juggling tricks um, and I'm going to try and show you how that works now so remember a Latin square is a square a square layout where there's a different symbol uh, there's some different symbols in there and no repeats in any row or column. Here's the link to juggling. So there's this big class of juggling tricks where 
you're holding some juggling balls and you want to throw the juggling balls and catch them and your rules are okay so here's the plan want to throw and catch juggling balls um, and the rules are only throw one at once only throw one at a time um, and also it works better if you only catch one at a time okay so on a kind of time graph on a kind of time graph we go over time here are some sort of unit times where I might throw something juggling has this kind of rhythm so there's kind of like um, kind of like uh, there's moments where you might throw something so do something do something do something do something do something do something it's got a kind of rhythm or beat to it so you get this kind of regular pattern okay um, so I might throw something in in this bit of time so this is time I might do a throw which is um, I'm planning so this is throw time on this axis um, so um, on this axis is going to be zero one two three four it's kind of rhythm of juggling of do thing do thing throw 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 um for example a kind of normal 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 juggling might have um me throwing stuff beep 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 i've got a wide camera for this switch to the wide camera so normal juggling might have a kind of throw 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 structure like this Throat, 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 throat. We see this kind of regular rhythm of throwing and catching. Throat, 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 catch, 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 catch. So if you think about that pattern of juggling, then you can write that up as having, you know, some throws. I guess the other interesting axis is when I'm going to catch them. So on my axis going this way is sort of catch time. And that's also discrete. This is kind of this rhythm going on. Um, and it turns out that if I throw at zero, then I want to catch. Let's say at three. That turns out to be a good idea. So I do a throw and a catch, throw and a catch. And if I keep throwing at kind of equal equal heights, so I'm going to throw, throw, throw equal heights. Um, then this is going to be a kind of straight line. Y equals x plus three or something. Okay, with me so far. We're going to throw things along, throw things along this axis, and we're going to catch them at, at some later time. Okay, so these are the event, the events that are happening in juggling. I'm going to throw this ball. Each cross represents one ball that I'm throwing. I'm going to throw it hit, hit at this time, and then catch it, catch it later. Okay. So, here's the link to juggling tricks. Let's draw in the lines. We've got, um, so juggling tricks happen when instead of just doing your your juggling balls like along this straight line of, of events, um, you deviate from that. Maybe you throw a ball super high um, and while it's going super high, you do something else as well. Uh, here's an example, he says. <laughs> Um, so an uh, example of that might be um, you're doing normal juggling, normal juggling, uh, and then you do a cheeky high throw like that, and in between there's enough time while there's a high throw going on to do something else. So you might do a cheeky high throw and then keep juggling and drop everything, hitting a microphone in the progress. There's not a lot of space here for juggling. Um, let's do that one more time. So normal juggling like that, and then one high throw, and during the high throw, do something else while, while that's going on. And I missed it a second time, and now I'm going to sit down. <laughs> so that might look something like this. Um, I guess if I'm drawing my lines, drawing my kind of grid lines, then I might have a plan to, you know, throw this ball, this ball, um, do this ball normally. It's one ball, at kind of zero, three, four, five, six. Um, um, but then the next ball I'm going to throw super high and then at the next the next point I've got a choice I could throw this ball quite high 
Um, I could throw this ball a bit lower than normal. So you know, normal would have been throwing along this line. Do the next ball a bit lower and then throw this ball higher again. Okay, and then carry on as normal over here. So it's kind of normal juggling over here. A juggling trick occurs where we do something off, off this normal line. This is normal. Um, off this normal line and then normal juggling regimes. Okay, so here's, here's a very small juggling trick. Um, and you can build new juggling tricks by coming up with new, um, new Latin squares. Because new Latin squares give you a new pattern that obeys, all of the, obeys both of these rules. So if you take your, new Latin, take your Latin square, pick one of the symbols in it, and that gives you a new pattern of allowable throw and catch patterns. Um, so you can use this to develop new juggling tricks.